60 minutes, maybe more. This is just a really hot topic. And I know that um, my, my cohorts here have lots to offer. And so we're gonna, we're pretty much gonna be going for it. So again, if you guys are just joining in, welcome. This is the experts panel with Sound Girls. I'm Samantha Potter. We're gonna be talking about kind of just careers and everything that falls underneath that. Imposter syndrome, resumes, networking, the whole thing. Uh, we have lots of great questions to get into. And so, I mean, I guess we shall not waste any more time. Uh, let me take a second to hide everybody that is not, uh, does not have their camera on so I can see you guys. All right, there we go. So uh, I guess first we should probably introduce ourselves panel. Uh, I, I'll go first since I'm already talking, but uh, I'm Samantha Potter. I'm an audio engineer. Uh, I'm a senior editor with Pro Sound Web and I host a podcast and help with their education stuff. And I'm also the manager of commercial and install audio for Allen and Heath USA. So doing all that stuff, I've done a lot of house of worship, install commercial, a lot of um, local stuff here in Kansas City, I'm doing mixing front of house mostly, uh, doing a lot of production work, but it seems lately lots and lots of house of worship work. So that is me. Um, Megan, you are the, the tile directly next to me. So how about you go next? Uh, my name is Megan Holmes. I work for Eighth Day Sound. We are an audio vendor that supplies uh, concert systems, touring equipment, festivals, weddings, bar mitzvahs, public shows. Um, <clears throat> I have been in the industry for almost 30 years. <laughs> Uh, and uh, I have held an array of positions, uh, touring positions, mixing front of house monitors, doing lots of tech work. Uh, and I started doing sales and personnel management for a company named Delicate Productions. I worked for them for 19 years and started the branch of Eighth Day Sound here in Los Angeles in 2016. And as many of you probably already know, we got bought out by Claire Global this past year. So uh, I now am proud to work under the Claire Global umbrella um, and do sales and project management and personnel and whatever else they need me to do. That's me. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, Whitney, you're up next. I always have to go after Megan. Um, <laughs> hi guys. Um, I'm Whitney. I am a freelance monitor engineer up until fall of last year. I was a production manager for live nation in Los Angeles for clubs and theaters, um, landing at the Velasco theater in downtown. Um, I worked for that company for about seven and a half years, pre pandemic did everything from stagehand to bartending to a stage manager. Um, uh, was hoping to continue with that, but obviously um, 2020 kind of threw a little wrench right there. But um, spent most of my time in clubs and theaters. Um, I've been in the industry about 10 years now. Uh, worked independent venues, uh, worked at the big boys, um, done about five years of touring as a monitor engineer nationally and internationally. So um, questions about clubs, theaters, getting into that kind of stuff, um, I might be your person for that. Um, but yeah, hi, that's me. Hi. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Except let's see, let's do Jim. Jim, what are you doing these days? I'm in my car. Mm -hmm. Not cool. Mm -hmm. Not professional. Um, well, I, uh, recently started with, uh, solo tech in January as the, uh, director of their in, in audio in U in the U S um, but prior to that, uh, 40 years as a front of house engineer, uh, started in bars in Western Canada and uh, ended up in uh, Orlando for a long time. And then um, Anderson, South Carolina, where I, I currently live, uh, at least until the, hell, the house sells. Um, and uh, yeah, I've uh, mixed, uh, I mixed monitors for many years and then uh, got to do my dream job, which was mix in front of house in, in concerts for... Uh, Bands like Van Halen and uh, Extreme um, and some crooners, Engelbert Humperdinck, uh, Julio Iglesias, and uh, then recently uh, Gwen Stefani, uh, funny Rob Thomas. So, uh, and then two tours with Journey, which was uh, super, super awesome for, uh, for a guy who, yeah, hearing your favorite songs every night is pretty cool. So, um, 
So yeah, uh, in January, I took the uh, role as uh, audio director with uh, Solotech and I'll be moving to Nashville in June. And um, yeah, send us resumes. Everyone send your resumes to me. You're gonna, whew, good. Are you, your inbox is a little exploding right now. <laughs> like. <laughs> you hid that. <laughs> like, I... All right, thank you very much. Okay, and finally, our last panelist, Tina. What is up? Hi guys, uh, my name is Tina Morris. I'm the studio manager at the uh, Village Recorder or the Village Studios in Los Angeles. Started uh, working in studios as an audio engineer in 1995. Also teched, did studio design, studio installation, just anything I could get my hands on to. Um, and then finally in 2006, moved to Los Angeles got a job at the at the village as a runner slash tech and just kind of stuck there ever since and became manager in 2008 and have been doing that ever since even through this chaos it's been very interesting um but you know we're, we're still going strong and feeling very fortunate about that and uh yeah that's that's about me in a nutshell Awesome. Very cool. Well, I'm, thank you guys for, for joining me. This is, I've been looking forward to this. As soon as um, the first like emails came across uh, with Carrie, I was like, oh yeah, this is going to be a really important one. So thank you guys very much for joining me. I, I appreciate it. Um, I am, you know, I'm among fantastic audio people. So uh, I'm excited. You guys, I'll be the most excited here. It's fine. Um, let's kind of get started and one of the, the more asked questions just kind of throughout uh, young tech's years, the beginning of their careers, uh, as well as the questions that came up a lot during the registration is how do we get started? You know, how did we get started and how does one get started in audio engineering? Uh, let's see, who seems like they are chomping at the bit to answer this? Um, gosh, uh, Whitney, do you want to go not after Megan now? <laughs> Yeah, I'll go not after Megan. Um, getting in as far as engineering, is that what the, that's what the question was? Or yeah, just how like do you, how getting you into- started in your career? Um, God, for me, I feel like I, I just, I probably told everyone that that's what I wanted to do. I kind of put it out there and it was just, I mean, I, I did a couple, I wouldn't call them missteps, but I, I tried school. Um, I tried, I tried- you know, begging people that were friends that were in bands to let me come do stuff. Um, none of that really ever worked out for me. W what worked was finally, like I planted enough seeds and I met enough people and I kind of was like networking, even though I didn't have anything to go off of. Um, like literally with people at festivals that I would meet um, and just let them know I was interested or I was going to school or whatever. And I finally got a job at a venue um, just as a stagehand and that's where it started. So um, that being said, it was, you know, it was after I had moved from Boston, I moved home to Orange County to pay off some debts. And then I got the call to move back to Boston. So it was literally a call like, hey, can you start in two weeks? I can pay you like 75 bucks a day. And I was like, yep. And so I just threw all the stuff I had in my car and just drove right back. Um, so sometimes it takes that. That's, that's how it happened for me. It was like, I really had to knock on a lot of doors before, before the one thing came and I just jumped right on it. Like when it comes, you just got to grab it. Um, yeah. that that's my advice. <laughs> yeah. And I think that that's, I, I won't speak for everybody, but from my experience in talking with other engineers throughout my career is that it's really like lots and lots of door knocking and you have to be prepared for because like literally any minute like you could get that email or that call that's like suddenly you're going to work back in Boston or so you're on your first tour or like it can it all changes just that quickly and that's what's kind of fun and what's kind of scary about the yeah. audio industry is that um it's not it may not be going today but this afternoon it might kind of yeah thing. maybe I'm sure Megan will touch on this but it's uh you know, it's different for me, like as in a hiring role that I was in uh, for Live Nation, it was when I'm hiring people with no experience or little to no experience, because that seems kind of maybe what we're talking about here. Um, it, it really, they had to be willing to take that bottom level, you know, they had to have that good attitude, like 
just keep trying and keep trying to get that stage hand or whatever runner yeah. position. Um, yeah, that, that attitude that's is like what it, everything. Yeah, I don't know what Megan looks for, like that kind of, you know, at sound companies, I don't know if they hire with no experience, um, but we do, we did. And, and it just took the right timing. You know, just being, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I applied at House of Blues in Anaheim. I wanted to work there so bad. Um, and they would never hire me. Like I tried to be a, a bartender. I tried to be a stagehand. I tried to be anything. I tried to get in through the kitchen avenue because I had like <laughs> hospitality experience. Yeah, yeah. Uh-uh. No, mm -mm. they never called me. So it just takes a lot of time. Planting a lot of seeds. Yeah. Planting lots of seeds. Yep. I love that. Planting okay. So we, Megan, we've already said your name like three times. So now you can follow Whitney. <laughs> what, what, are, what say you? So two things. One is I started as a stagehand too. And um, I think that is one of your best networking opportunities if you're in the live side of the music industry, because you get to see people coming through, you get to meet more people, you get to see what equipment they're using, you get an opportunity to touch a bunch of different things. You can see what companies kind of, or what organizations you might feel more comfortable being around or more aligned with. Um, it exposes you to doing other forms of work. So uh, I was an audio person, but I also did video and lighting. Um, that was good for me, I feel, as an all around like production person and having an eye for what's happening around me, especially on tour. Um, I think all of those things are beneficial and that's an, an amazing pathway in. Um, internships, you know, at companies like, you know, Jim's and ours, are common um, coming out of the pandemic, maybe a little bit less common, but um, it is how we get people started and we take people that don't have any experience at all at times or have like, they've gone to Crass or they've gone to Full Sail or they've gone to USC or UCLA through their, their technical theater programs or whatever. We've had interns from all of those uh, colleges I also went to CalArts. I also went, I have a degree in technical theater and sound design. Was that a waste of my time or money? Probably not because that's how I got in to be a stagehand. And I, I learned how to network in college. And I went to college with some amazing people who are very prolific in our industry now. Um, and those are my friends coming up. So. I don't think it's a waste of time to go to one of these schools. If you have no other point of entry, if there's no small club in town that you can go and try and get a job at, or, you know, the other thing is, is going and mixing at your church is another amazing or learning audio at your church is another amazing pathway. Mm -hmm. When you're starting out, you have to be willing to do the dirty work. You have to be willing to, you know, run the feeder and unload the truck and, and honestly, I think that's a good thing because if you can't hang through that, you're going to have a really rough time as, you know, things get more intense in your life. So that's my two cents about getting in. I think there's more avenues and I think they're all valid and they all have open doors for so many people that I am around all the time and work with. So, you know, and talking about it. That was the other thing Whitney said, talking about what yeah. you want, what you want to do, tell everybody. I want to do this. I'm into it. I'm so into it. I love it. It's the thing that excites me. I want to learn more about it. I'll come and shadow you for free for a day. Like just keep talking about it because that will open doors for you too. And how does anybody know what you want to do? Somebody like me, yeah. how do I know unless you tell me? So. Right. Like we're not mind readers. So if you are always talking about, I've got these big aspirations, like I love, I want to work hard. I want to learn everything. Uh, amazing. I don't meet enough of those kinds of people who are just, just stoked to be there in whatever capacity, just stoked to be there. That those are the people that you, you can like, I don't know if everybody else feels this way, but like, I'm usually able to tell if somebody's going to make it in the industry, like in a very short amount of time, like just because of their attitude and how they're approaching whatever we're doing. Like you have to be excited about wrapping cable or running lines. Like it, that's going to be like, Say that you again, Megan. Show up five minutes early to every call and be ready to work. Yep. Call time's 10 a.m. and you're there at quarter till 
and you've gone to the bathroom and gotten settled and figured out where you're going and found a place to put your stuff and kind of gotten your game face on and your tools or whatever you need to do your job and you're ready at 10 a.m. We all notice that Mm -hmm. because that means you care. That means you're into it. That means you want it. Um, People are constantly late, constantly, constantly. I question their, their ability or their integrity or their, their want to do this. So you really show physically show who you are right out of the gate. And I agree with Samantha, we can tell 100% if you're into it or not. It, it's obvious, all of those things, your, your body language, showing up on time, being willing to help, not feeling like you're above anything, just jumping in. These are all qualities that, that we all want to surround ourselves with and we want to work with, so. Absolutely, absolutely. Look- uh, okay, so uh, Jim, how how what would your advice be for for getting started in this field? Um, well, you've got just so much great advice already. Um, all the stuff about having a having a great attitude, um, and and like you said, Sam, when you when you are let's say you have six stage hands helping you set up your front of house stuff, and um, a couple of them are talking the whole time, looking at their phones. And then you got a couple folks who are uh, absolutely just focusing on listening to everything you're saying, doing it, you know, set your stuff up the way you are asking it to be done. You kind of get a feeling these people are probably going to make it, you know, they're going to be okay. Um, I know that uh, when I, uh, that the whole stagehand angle is, is so great because um, as, as you guys were saying, when, you get to see all the gear, you get to meet all these folks, you get to see how different companies do stuff. It's a great way in. I, I went in uh, through the bar band uh, mixing side of things. Um, I should have never been made it through my first week because I'm <laughs> a terrible sound engineer. For the first week, month, six months, I, I was you know, luckily I was with a bunch of musicians that were playing like the C circuit in Western Canada and it just kind of didn't matter. And we were all cool and we were making our 50 to 75 bucks a week, a week. And uh, so we, we all just kind of, you know, had, had grace for each other and let each other, you know, kind of find our way. But um, that, that consistency of, I mean, we did shows six days a week um, Monday to Saturday, we would play every week. So, so I did, my skills did get, uh, better, uh, faster, but, um, that's definitely one way the intern side of things. Um, I've, I've been connecting with some folks at, at Belmont and doing some mentoring and stuff. Um, I know there's, there's, uh, uh, MTSU in Nashville as well that, that uh, Solotech in the past before me coming there has used some folks from from uh, those production schools to be interns that's a great way to get in as well you know you kind of got to be willing to not get paid or get paid very little but you will be surrounded by people who are smarter than you and that it it's almost always that way I think everyone in this panel will tell you that after 10 years or 30 years or 40 years of doing this, I, I walk into the room of, of, you know, I did Super Bowl two years ago. Every single audio person there knew way more than me. And it's, and it's, it's awesome to constantly remind yourself that you're around people who can teach you stuff and soak it in and, um, you know, exchange numbers. Be, be helpful, be on time, be uh, quiet when they're talking. And, um, you know, when you get an opportunity, like uh, Whitney said, you know, tell them what you want out of this business. Like, what is it that you really want to do? I, I was mixing monitors for some pretty cool bands, but I kept saying, I really just want to be a front of house engineer. And I, I kept bothering uh, managers and uh, record company reps until I got my shot at it. So, um, yeah, be vocal with uh, the people who can put you in the in a position. Um, you know, you don't want to pester anyone, but I've been telling folks uh, 
as we come out of the pandemic and I've been in my new role, um, someone will send a resume to me or, and, and uh, say, hey, you know, can you uh, find some work for me when things get going? And my, my one bit of advice to them always is, great, I'll pass this on to our label, uh, labor folks, but just ping me every couple of weeks. Like, just keep reminding me that you're interested because I think that goes a long way. Again, uh, Jim's email inbox is exploding right now. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, we can. Uh, and, and finally, Tina, what, what, do you have any, any sage advice? Oh, gosh. Um, well, from the studio side of things, you know, like for me, when I was still in school, I got an internship at a studio called Sound Techniques and literally just like was there every waking moment that I physically could. I was, you know, sitting in the back of the room, observing everything, assisting everybody that needed assistance. I just, I was like on them like a cheap suit. It was, I was like, I'm holding on for dear life. You know, I had gotten this opportunity. A lot of people were like, well, you're only required to be here for one day. And I'm like, I don't care. Like I'll close up. Let me just like watch everything and like teach me how to use like all the machines and you know, got my hands. I mean, this is before Pro Tools. We had 3324s, we had Studers, we had fair, fair light, post-production, you know, editing systems, everything. I was like, teach me how to use everything. And then, you know, I stuck around so much that the tech actually just in passing was like, I need help soldering um, and recapping the Neve console. And I was like, I know how to solder. And that was like my first paid gig was just, I just happened to just be hanging around so much that I just overheard him to say, oh, hey, I need help with this. I'm like, I'll help you with this. And then I ended up, you know, recapping a whole Neve V3 console um, as my first like real paid gig, which was pretty amazing because it took a very long time with a lot of caps. Um, and then, yeah, just kind of, you know, just stuck around and then you know, just kind of kept my relationships going. And that that's the thing too, is how I even got into that internship was through, you know, networking with other students and everything at school. It was like, oh, hey, you're going over there. Oh, hey, let me know when they have an opening. I'd love to, you know, I'd love to apply. And they, you know, kind of tipped me off as to, you know, hey, there is an opening and I got to apply, you know? So, and, and I think it's just, I think it's just like being around and being hungry for it. You know what I mean? Hunger, um, yeah. It, yeah. And it's, there's, I think with school being what it is, it's, it's a little harder after you've paid a whole bunch of money to go to school and you're in student debt to be like, Oh, Hey, let me work for free or let me work for minimum wage. And it's yep. a, it's a little hard on the ego and, you know, just as a, as a person that hires, I see that a lot where it's like, well, I paid X amount for my degree. Why am I, why am I working for minimum wage at a studio? Right. <laughs> and it's, and it, it's not the, you have to see it as like an extension, like an entry-level position is an extension of your education. Yes. So, you know, and if you happen to get paid for that, it's a bonus you know, for like the entry level thing, once you like really are starting to use your skills that you're trained for and everything, yes, you definitely a hundred percent need to get paid properly for that. But, but yeah, I think like, you know, like a runner position, intern position definitely has to be seen as an extension of, of your degree. Like, especially like when I got to my internship, I was like, well, you know, I'm almost through school. I know the S SSL in and out. I know all these consoles, I know what the microphones do and everything, but the like human interaction, school cannot teach you that no. at all. You, you can't have a, a, a group of your peers when you're in you know, session in school, it is completely different than when you get to the real world and you have all these, you know, all these different personalities, you need to learn that and learn the culture. And that's something that you don't get when you're in school. So, um, so I think, yeah, I think you just have to kind of um, 
yeah, you just have to enjoy the journey in a way and yeah, just take what you can get and then just absorb everything. Just Mm -hmm. every experience is a learning experience. And I always tell people like, don't say no to experiences. Like don't say no to anything professionally, you know, because you never know where that's going to take you. Yeah. Like I've done, you know, studio install. It was just like, oh, hey, Ken that, you know, Ken that you helped out with the Neve. He said, you're really good at soldering. You want to, you know, install a couple of studios for me. And if I was like, no, I think I'm really a recording engineer. I'm not going to do this. I wouldn't have gotten into studio installation and then met another studio owner right. that then hired me as an engineer. So it's like it, you kind of have to bob and weave through everything as well. So much bobbing and waving, yeah. but it's yes. like, again, I love that idea of like, you have to enjoy the journey because it's, it's, and I'm learning this now is that there's this maybe not a mountaintop that we're like for us to hit. It's like our careers are just these like ever evolving, like blobs, uh, where our tastes are changing, what we're good at changes. We, we really find out what we're bad at and what we really easily excel at and to lean into those things. And I think that's just part of growing up and uh, developing your career, but, but yeah, enjoying the journey and wanting to just, again, the idea of just being excited and caring and wanting to soak up everything. I, that's, that's perfect. Um, Whitney, I think this may be a question that you might be specifically great to answer, but, um, somebody asked, you know, how do I get my foot in the door specifically at clubs or, uh, uh live venues and things like that? Really trying to, um, I mean, really just kind of wedge in there and get those jobs. And they made the note that they do live in a town uh, with music and arts opportunities, but maybe you can answer for both. Um, I'm trying to keep the fact that COVID is really relevant here um, in my answer is, I think that just from a venue standpoint now, there's, I mean, this whole past year, all of these people that I had that were on my roster, right? just touching base and and this kind of speaks to networking too with all of them. I've kept in touch with not all of them, but a lot of them. Um, A lot of them have moved on. A lot of them have moved on to other things. A lot of them have moved to other cities. Um, Some of them, most of them want to get back in, but it might not be at the same venue that they were at before, because this is going to, I think this is going to give a lot of opportunity because that has happened. This need is going to exist for these venues to have to rehire their staff, you know, everything, box office, stagehand, security, bartenders, um, like everyone, they're going to have to rehire. So this could potentially be a great time for people looking to get their foot in the door or just get a little more, get more experience with minimal experience. Um, Because I think they're going to have to have hiring fairs at some point. Um, And my suggestion with that, if you're looking, uh, this would be like specifically for like an AEG or maybe like a Live Nation venue, they're going to host probably these big hiring fairs. They're usually in the past, they've historically been multiple days. Um, My suggestion is get there on the first day because I think that typically they have quotas for every position that they can meet based on budget, right? So based on like, hey, we can only hire five bartenders. We can only hire two box office. I'm making up numbers, but I think they're gonna be um, more frugal right out of the gate because they don't they don't know what's gonna happen with COVID. They don't wanna dis- disappoint or have to take on the weight of hiring all these people at once. Mm-hmm. Um, so that being said, don't wait till day two when these hiring fairs happen, go right away. First thing, be the first one, whatever you have to do to get there. Because even when I was hiring, I would meet my quotas for some positions on day one. Like if you want to be an LD, it might so happen that the best LDs come out day one. And then those people that subsequently show up, they can't apply for the initial position that they wanted. Um, Just to touch on that a little bit more, there's someone that I just spoke with this morning. Um, I hired him to work at a venue in LA and this speaks to this exact scenario, right? He came in and my audio engineer positions were full. It was like day three, I think of the hiring fair. And I was sitting there and they brought me someone and I was still hiring stagehands. So this guy sits down in front of me. Oh, this guy's, you know, somebody walks him over. He's applying for a stagehand position. Cool. Hi, nice to meet you. 
Um, and I start looking at his resume and I'm like, wait, 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 you're applying for a stagehand position. He's got like, you know, front of house engineer for all these really prominent bands, bands I recognize, I, you know, tour after tour, after tour, after tour. And I'm like, whoa, 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 dude, you're not a stagehand. You're a, you're an engineer, you know? And he says to me, he was super cool. He was like, yeah, but they, they told me at the front that you were full with all those positions. So I'm just happy to be here. Um, would love to just get in. And, and if you need stage hands, I'll, I'll be your guy. You know, I'm cool. And I was just like, done. I like you. I like you, you know? So yeah. that's my advice is like, and he went on to be the guy like Jim was talking about where he would just um, offer his help all the time. You know, like after a load in, he'd come up to me and be like, Hey, you need help with anything settlement? Like, do you need me to set up you know some signs in the backstage area like he was always that guy he wasn't he didn't bother me he wasn't too much but he always let me know he was interested he always let me know he was available um I hired him as an engineer I made an exception to hire him because I just was like I don't I appreciate you you know but I I'm gonna do this because you're just way talented and I would love to have you so don't be discouraged if that happens to you. If you show up and you're like, you know, try and take some, what else you got? You know, oh, we're hiring a box office. Cool. You know, I'll sell some tickets. Like I'll handle VIP lines. Um, when it comes, that's COVID specific and it's kind of all the time, you know, to kind of, yeah. you're going to have to have that attitude. And um, I don't know how, I don't know. Part of me thinks that a lot of people have stepped away but part of me also thinks that it's going to be really competitive coming back in certain markets. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I, my, my mind doesn't match with some other people I've talked to um, that work for my former company. So I don't know, I don't know how that's going to turn out. Um, I think your best bet is to be the early, the early worm, you know, and be cool and be willing to do whatever. Um, it, I think it might kind of feel like starting over for some people that even are more experienced, like they might show up and think they're gonna get it and they might not get it. Um, so, and then as far as independent venues go, I don't know what their gig's gonna be. Um, I know they're probably gonna have to rehire some people too. I don't know if they do the hiring fairs. I never, when I worked for independent venues, it was never really like that. It was always reaching out to like their network. So maybe, um, maybe if you know people, that are working at venues, um, get ahead of it. Like for me, I've been staying in contact with people just to keep the feeling just, just for friends, you know, right. and, and, yeah. but also to get the vibe, like what is, what's going on? Are people going to be available? You know, for a while I was really keeping contact because I thought I might get to keep my, my gig. So I want to know where my people were. Um, and a lot of people recently have been reaching out to me, Hey, wit, what's going on? You know? Um, so that's my suggestion too, is like, if you were at this, at a venue, maybe you haven't been working or you're trying to get in, probe those people, you know, probe the people that, um, that, you know, are connected or you've had, you've worked with before. Um, hopefully you've already done that and it's not an afterthought, but there's still time, you know, it's like Megan said, stuff's starting to kind of ramp up. I'm starting to feel it a little bit. So, um, your network's always number one, but if you do find yourself in a hiring fair or you do find yourself knocking on the door at the venue, just be persistent, you know, and just be like that guy who sat down in front of me and was like, I'm cool with whatever. I'm not, I don't have an attitude, you know, like I'm, you don't need an engineer. You don't need an engineer. Well, I'll push some cases, you know? And, and that was like exactly what those kind of people are looking for. They want people that are going to work hard, um, that want it. And that speaks across the entire industry. So that will yeah. always be your friend. That'll always do you well. Yeah. yeah. I was just about to make a, a, a similar comment um, that it's it's going to go one of two ways. Uh, there will either be more jobs and people to fill uh, or everybody will be really, really tight fisted and there's going to be way too many people for the amount of jobs. Uh, I, I'm i sure some of our, our panelists might have an idea of where it's going, but it's like we're oh. all literally just like we were waiting. We're basically waiting um, to see what happens. Um, and kind of the idea of we've always run on this networking idea. And that's still really important. Like those relationships we have with people in the field are always going to be number one. But for those that just starting out, like suddenly 
like resume stuff, I, I think is going to mean more um, going into this. That you'll have a, a better chance maybe to to kind of get in because so many people have kind of retired after this last year or they found other jobs where it's like, wow, benefits. Well, I'm not going to go do this other thing anymore. That kind of deal. And so now you can like get in there. And so when we're talking about resumes, uh, you know, there's always uh, really great advice. Uh, Piper Payne always recommends having your email address, um, like say your name. <laughs> we were talking about this before we went live, but it's like very annoying, I would say, to try to find somebody when, when you do need someone. Um, of like, oh snap, like what is there? And I want to just like type the first three letters of your first or your last name. And if your email address doesn't pop up, like you're putting in a lot of blocks and I'm not going to try super hard. I have to go to the next person or I have to go to the next thing. And, uh, you know, uh, Megan, does that sort of thing happen with you where it's like, you just need to have quick access. Like if you're trying to find somebody, you're trying to find someone. My biggest resume tip slash pet peeve is do not title the document of your resume, resume. <laughs> Please title the name of the document that is your resume, Megan Holmes resume. Take your name and then use the word resume. It's fine. Or you can put 2021, your name, resume. But please make your name part of it, please. please. <laughs> I mean, it's, it links on to Piper's thing where it's like, it, the more associations we have with your name, the more readily we can find you and access your information, the better. Yeah. Uh, Tina, you, did you have something to add? Oh, yes. <laughs> For this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. And make it, um, you know, like, don't do your resume in like some weird format. I know Word is, is pretty universal now. Usually, you know, email me a PDF, easily openable version of your resume do not send me your website with a link to the link to the resume none of that like it's, it's like you know here's like a link to my soundcloud and my and and my resume and everything it's like no i just want to click on a pdf on my mm. phone and just be like yes there it is like i don't need to go through like a, you know like i just don't have hoops to like search for for everything like just as if you're like in front of me and say, here's a piece of paper, please read it. You know, um, yeah. it's just, everybody's getting really fancy with like all the socials and stuff. And it's like, no, I just want to see, there's a PDF in my email. Okay, cool. And like Megan said, it has your name on it. So when I put it in, in a, you know, the resumes folder on my computer, it just doesn't say resume. It says, you know, Megan Holmes resume. Um, keep it simple, like really. And then also just make sure you're not like sending me from like weird emails. Um, one guy, his email was sex idol 66. <laughs> and like, I, I deleted it. I just, and he kept on emailing me too. And I was like, okay, I know that guy and he's not going to get a job here. Cause Black that's listing. just weird. Just really weird. So yeah. So that's all I have to say about yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jen, did you have any particular resume tips or anything, things, especially now you're, you're in, um, you know, uh, definitely in a more hiring position. Like what, what do you see or what are you looking for um, with resumes? Well, I'm sure there's, you know, resume uh, videos and, and self-help things online um, that might say something different. But for me, if I'm looking for a front of house engineer for a, a tour and someone specializes as a front of house engineer, I, I, I like to see their name very clearly, their contact information. Um, and then I, I just want to see like a quick hit list of what you've done in the last 10 years kind of thing. Right. If, if, if it's a, you know, if, it, if it's a position with, with a band that's pretty notable, you've probably have 10 years experience of mixing bands. If you don't, you know, um, just the, the last couple things you did that were of, of note, but in that position, I, I don't want to have to get to the end of the first page or flip to the second page to see your work experience. I kind of like to see that first and then your education maybe and some of the, um, you know, cool things that you've done uh, later in the, in the document. Um, 
I, I think that's it as far as resumes. Um, I, I've actually been looking at a lot more of them lately because of this new yeah. position. And, and it's, it's kind of interesting, like, um, uh, like Elliot sent me his and Elliot's looks great. You know, uh, it, it's really formatted nicely. And, um, but all, but all the important stuff is there, you know? So, um, you know, mine is, yeah, I, I've actually been looking at mine and going, man, I need to get some resume game together. Cause this, this, just a boring old word doc turned into a PDF, you know, this is so, plain text. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, you know, so, um, just, yeah, just formatted nicely experience, uh, at the top, you know, nice and clear so that you can see things. And, um, like I said, just every couple of weeks, just, just hit that person up that you're trying to, uh, connect with you guys were talking about uh networking and how um that's all different now uh, but but i think still the people that you talk to the most are the ones who um who are going to remember you you know uh, for a position so just mm -hmm. stay connected with people and um and uh just you know, like every couple of weeks, Hey, uh, just checking in and, and keep it short because people are busy, but just, you know, just checking in and making sure, uh, you know, see if there's anything new come up that I might, uh, be good at, um, that I might qualify for and, uh, keep your resume, uh, nice and fresh, nice and updated. Yeah. That's a good one. And it looks like we're getting a couple of questions here. If it's okay, we'll hit those. Maybe uh, Megan, I saw you raise your hand. Wendy, I saw you raise your hand. I, I'm not, yeah. I saw you. I saw you. Uh, <laughs> um, one page, please. Really. Yeah, somebody asked um, one or two pages. I'm a one pager. Uh, I, I tried one pager. Please make it one page. And and it's okay if it's only the past five years. Really, it better be extraordinary for you to take it past ten years. Like it better be like amazing resume credit. But honestly. I want to know what you did in the past five years. Now, this past year, a throwaway year. Still tell me what you did though, please. Like if all you did was work in your church and you go and you worked at Costco, please put that on there. Or like, I have a friend who's a tour manager. He's also managing a grocery store. I, I want to know that because it meant that you kept working and you kept trying. And it's okay if you spent the past year working on your education and, and knowledge and everything, put that on there because there will be this weird gap year. Everybody's got it in their resume. There's only like 3% of the industry, I think still had their regular job, like myself and Tina, I think are probably the only two people that I know that kept their regular jobs. But you know, everybody's gonna have this quirky past year. So don't be afraid of it, put it on there. Yeah, uh, and hey, Whitney? my two cents. I have a question for Megan and Jim, maybe, maybe they might have the answer to this. Um, uh, I'm also looking at my resume, right? And I, past five years is what it is. Um, I finally got to the point where I don't have to fluff it with like random, you know, things, but I'm looking at it and I'm curious because to me, you know, I had this long kind of like, it was too long. It was like multiple pages and but it made me feel good because it had like a list of all the stuff I had done, you know, like, hey, I did this cruise and I did, you know, because that stuff, I feel like, like I survived two cruises in a row doing monitors on main stage. Like that feels important to me mm -hmm. to list because who knows who's looking at it, right? But um, how do you, like, aside from like, okay, I was a venue production manager. I was, you know, a stage manager for five years at this venue. And then I did, you know, these tours okay, five years is over. What about all the random stuff? Like, do you just kind of you have to push you have it to the side or what do you think? Is that relevant to you when you see it or are you not, not really? You have to call a little bit. So okay. if you tell me that you've done like a bunch of festivals, like, you know, and you want to make that a little chunk, that shows me that you've done a bunch of festivals, you know, and okay. you can here. If you've done a bunch of venue work, like you've got your, your promotion work and everything, tell me that. Cause that tells me that you've been a production manager and that's a useful skill that you have. That, so basically what you're trying to do is you're trying to show your versatility 
and your skills. So if, if I see it and I go, well, shit, I mean, she could be a project manager for us because she's got this production background and has the big picture, but she's also been an engineer and she's also toured. So kind of give me the hit parade in every category of what you feel is your, your life. And it's okay to kind of just give me a little bit of the great things in each one of those categories. Do you like it chronologically or do you like it better like, here's the venue experience, here's the tour stuff, here's, you know, cause I've kind of teetered back and forth and what's the clearest way? Uh, or second question, is uh -huh. it good to cater it towards whatever you're going towards? Like for a while I've had, here's my monitor engineer degree or resume, right? Like I'm trying I to get a monitor, <laughs> here's all my tours. Yes. And I've done TV and all this. And then I've got my other one that's like venue production manager, like festival stage manager. Like I've got all of that kind of, do you think that that's smart going? Okay. Cause maybe that's what I need to do. Yeah. Separate it out. You can also say like, because I also look for gaps because I'm like, well, what happened to this person? Like, you know, 2018 to 2019, there is nothing here. Like what happened during this time? <laughs> right, like, right, 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 right. When there's like two year gaps, it's like, so just make sure that you at least let me know that you were a venue production manager or whatever, and that that was consuming that, that chunk of time. But don't, you don't need to get deep with stage manager and all of that on a resume that you're sending to get an audio gig from, you know? Right, okay. Catering your resume and kind of directing it. Uh, I had years ago, I was applying to be a stage manager. I fluffed up the stage manager side of my resume and sent that. Uh, I had another time when I was applying to be a front of house engineer. I fluffed up that side of my resume. Some of the other hits stayed in there but I kind of made it slanted more towards whatever I was trying to get. And I think that's a good idea. Yeah. I okay. think it just kind of over the years of like, you pick up all, you do all these kind of like random, like little stuff. Like um, I had done like jazz festivals and like after a few years, it's like, why am I late? Why am I naming every single one of these? Like I'm just putting festival engineer and then list like these are the jazz festivals I did, blah, blah, blah. So they're like, exactly like me. Like, they're getting the idea that I've done these things, but I'm, I don't need to like the labor that I've done. Like that's unnecessary. I'm trying to fit this onto one page and somebody asked, let me go scroll up to find it. Uh, list more jobs, fewer details or a few jobs with more details. Um, and personally I go for like probably more jobs and fewer details and, and like really getting the bullet points of what that job did. But I'm assuming the person that's hiring me, um, is knows what's going. I don't, I don't need to be like cable organization and you know tape all the you know all that little stuff i don't think you need to, to hit that but uh does anybody have any thoughts on that when you, you um as long as you're listing all your jobs um like for me at the venue level um usually i'm typically hiring or was hiring um you know people all for below me people staging you know stage manager front of house ld runner you know things like that um I want to see what's relevant to me is the position you're applying for. So, you know, the first things I'm going to ask is uh, I'm applying for front of house school. How do you feel about a Yamaha console? You know, how do you feel if you ever mix on one, how long, you know, could you, if I threw you in front of a console, could you figure it out? You know, those kind of questions. Um, we see a lot of Digico. Can you, um, how do you feel about, you know, interfacing that with our house system, that kind of thing. I'm going to ask those kinds of like questions. So yeah, I don't think you need to list, like, I know how to use a Digico and I know how to, like, I don't think you need to list all that stuff anymore that I used to do um, personally, unless the job calls for it, like in the listing, like must know a Digico desk, you know, then if you're paying attention, you might want to mention that, you know, or maybe if, in, if you get the interview process, say right away, Hey, I really know how to use Digico. Um, that would be a selling point for me because that means less training for you, right? Um, it, it just makes me feel better about it. Um, the other thing is I was talking to my friend Heather and she said, don't lie on your resume. You know, don't lie. Because a lot of times when, when I was just recently looking at resumes last year, um, a lot of times it's a small world, um, even though I'm kind of new, I guess, um, I can still, like that guy I was interviewing that was going to be an audio engineer, or but he applied as a stagehand. I was like, oh, you work with this band. I was like, they're on the same label as a band I work for. And it was like, oh, you know so-and-so? 
if he had lied about that right then, I would have been like, no, dude, you know, or um, another thing, Heather's great for this stuff, but um, I was talking to her about someone else who I had recommended, I recommended someone to her for one of her artists. And um, he had something listed on his resume that um, she knew that camp, I didn't. Um, I'd only worked with him on one tour and thought it was great, but she talked to that camp and that camp did not have pleasant things to say. So make sure that if you're gonna list something on your resume, it's not a lie. Don't, don't extrapolate it um, and make it seem like it was way bigger than it was. Um, and make sure that those people know that you're listing them. You know, like if you're not sure, then you probably shouldn't list it. Um, or you should check in with them and make sure that they feel good about you like you think they do. Um, Cause that could go against you um, and then that, then that will trickle down. Right. So then those people will be like, Oh, that guy, uh, you know, and then it just kind of, so just, it's better to just cut those ones off. Um, I that agree goes for anything. with me 100%. <laughs> I have had people lie on their resume. Your information is verifiable. It is super easy for me yep. to start. I've been in the industry a long time. I know a bunch of people. I'll figure yeah. out like, figure out who you are if I don't know you already. I 100% agree too. Yeah, I'm right there with don't you. Lie. Don't lie. Be honest. Be proud of your achievements. It. Here's the other thing is, especially in the touring industry, we all have been fired by some band, by some artist, by somebody. Put the dates in there. Nobody's really like chasing after like exactly how it ended, right? Just put the dates in for the artists you work for. And if somebody asks you directly about it or whatever, great. And I also agree with Whitney on the, your references or the associations that we can make with your resume, probably you should make sure that you left a good taste in people's mouths, or you should probably figure out a way to leave that off of your resume. Because <laughs> when I'm calling around and saying, oh, this person worked for such and such company. I know this dude over there. And then he doesn't have nice things to say about you. That's really bad. And, and those, both of those things have happened to me multiple times. Please, please be super mindful of your, the credits that you list, the references you put, be honest, be clear, and make them the ones that you shined on or that you did your best. It's okay if you've been fired. It's totally cool. Everybody gets fired in our industry. It, it happens or we don't get asked back to do something for some reason. It's okay. That doesn't matter. What matters is, is that you didn't, you know, get drunk and throw up on yourself in the back lounge of the bus and get fired from the tour. Mm, like that's don't a different fire. Don't list that one. <laughs> yeah. Can I just add something really quick too while we're on the, on um, resumes? please take care to uh, spell check, proofread. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, when you are, cause you know, obviously when you're applying for jobs, you're probably like sending out a gazillion of these emails that are like, hi, so-and-so I'm interested in a position at your company. Always make sure you are addressing that correctly. I get this all the time. Hey, Tina. I would really love a job at Capitol Studios. My resume is attached. You know, please get back to me. And then I'll write back, well, that's wonderful. I suggest you contact Capitol Studios to, walk, to, to you know, apply for your a job because clearly you don't want to work at the village. Um, <laughs> uh, so, you know, that little details, because I mean, obviously if you're not willing to spend five minutes to, proofread your email and your correspondence it kind of already shows off the bat that maybe you don't care so much or you know i mean maybe you do but it looks like you don't care yeah it, it could have been a fumble but the optics are bad so uh so yeah jim well i was just gonna say uh you know i i know in the beginning um when i didn't have very many names on my resume um it uh you guys were talking about fluff, you know, and, and just putting everything in. Um, one thing I've, I've seen over the years is like, 
uh, someone who was a stagehand at, at a club. And, you know, that club got a lot of uh, national acts and they would, they would have 50 band names on their resume that they had worked with. And, and you're like, wow, this person's 24 years old. How, how have they done this? You know? And, um, and then, then at the end or something, it would say, uh, you know, mixed monitors for this one band. So you kind of, you kind of can figure out that they didn't really work with those bands. They, they worked at a club and those bands came in. So, um, I know, I know when you don't have a lot to put on your resume, you, you still want to show that you've been active and that's, that's cool. But, uh, but yeah, it, it's not, a, it's not really being like lying on your resume, but it's being a bit deceitful. If you list uh, a whole whack of bands that you just help load in the show kind of thing. So hmm. just a little clarity with that, I think helps. Yeah. Same thing on festivals. Don't send me a list of bands that were on the festival that you were working for the audio company on. Right. I've gotten that one too. This huge list of the bands. It's like, <laughs> oh my God, have you worked for all these bands? Oh, well, I did a festival with so-and-so. And it's just like, okay, you did a festival with Lady Gaga. You don't get to put her on your resume. You get right. to put the festival in the position that you did on your resume. So tell me you did Firefly in, in 2019 and you were the monitor tech on the main stage. Absolutely, I want to know that. But don't tell me you worked for Lady Gaga that day when she didn't, you know, she didn't hire you. She didn't pay you. Whoever's paying you, that's who you get to put on your resume. If I'm on tour with Lady Gaga, that's literally the first, that's, that's, I'll, that's, that'll be the whole resume. It's just like, here, this is <laughs> what I did. You're, I'll, I'll welcome the paycheck whenever you're ready. Page um, one, Lady yeah, Gaga, page... done. <laughs> Finished. Uh, we've also had a, um, a couple of, questions and a couple of comments in the chat um, about the vaccine and if you should note that on the resume i'll just kind of i'm gonna answer for everybody so uh just go ahead if you've been vaccinated um it's gonna be necessary in this field if you want to be working around people just go ahead and put it on well i'm sure hopefully there will be a time in the future where that won't matter but for now it's probably best to put it on uh, we are we are yeah. already seeing bands request that their crew be vaccinated so if ever you were on the fence about getting vaccinated, really, uh, if you plan on doing live sound and touring, you, you've, you've, you've got to go get the vaccine. No, none of those audio companies, you know, none of the-, the It's a liability. We can't, we can't mandate that our employees get the vaccine, but our clients are already asking for that. And it's not just the touring stuff. I'm getting asked for local techs to have the vaccine too. So honestly, like if you want to go to a venue and work, you, you, you got to go get your vaccine. You got to do it. It's, and put it it's, it's, a, it's a strange selling point. I never thought, um, you know, for sales, what I'm booking and it's, you know, for a, you know, a movie crew or video crew at this point, they say, well, how, how much of your, your staff is vaccinated? And strangely, I never thought I'd have to be like proudly 99% of us are you know so it's yeah it's, I'd, I'd put it on tricky. it's a little tricky uh like you said uh requiring that you know I'm sure there's all kinds of employment um stuff that is you know you you can't require it but somebody can and you can say you know I just think like like Samantha said for all of us I think it just is best to get that done so yeah. Yep. It's, um, it's, it's not us, the people who are hiring or the companies that are saying it, it's the people who are paying the companies that are saying this needs to happen. So that's, that's their right. It's their money. So, um, and then, uh, Erica also asked, um, uh, thoughts on listing the references available on request or just like straight listing your references all the time. I, I moved to a point where I just had, uh, available on request because I didn't want my uh, references to get surprised with a call like completely out of the blue without me realizing it. Um, and it was also a good reason for the company to have another touch point with me. What do you guys say about that? I enjoy the right. avail available upon request um, just because it saves space on your resume, you know, on that one, one page. page. Mm -hmm. And if, if, anybody feels the need, then yeah, we can just contact you again. And you're, you know, Sam, you're right. Like, yes, it 
gives them a reason to give you a call and you know that they're interested because they said, Hey, can I, can I get your references now? So that's kind of a good little like temperature check maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Whitney. Yeah. Well, and again, it's kind of like for me, at least um, if I really feel, if I'm looking at your resume and I'm not sure, and I, and I can't make those contacts, like a lot of times I can make those contacts. I know someone on your, without you having to list your resume, your references, I might be like, I know this guy at this venue. And I'll just call him and be like, dude, you know, this, how's this guy? You like him? This person um, suck or like, what's so that? So yeah. anything you, essentially anything you list, we might, someone, or I might go, Hey, do you know, Hey, this guy worked for a cruise thing. Did you, did you do that? Do you know him? Like it's that fast. So whatever you list, you're already kind of listing your references, <laughs> maybe not your chosen references. Um, but if like Tina said, if I need, if I'm like, I don't recognize any of these, I don't know, I'm not sure. Then I might ask that person, Hey, can you toss me some of your references? Um, I don't think there's a need to list it. A lot of times people do. And I, I just might look at it and go, do I know those people? No. You know, that's what I'll do. Um, I've never personally, I've actually never called someone I didn't know and go, hey, um, there's a guy listing. I'm hi, I'm so and so from you know this venue. I've never done that. It's always someone I know because I can't. No offense to those people, they're probably great, but I can't. I want to touch base with someone I know and see if they liked him. Like I call Megan all the time, or I'll email her. Hey, do you know this guy? Is he cool? You know. Um, so. I don't think it's worth it. I think wait till they ask. Yep. I'm on the fence on this one. Ooh. I'm going to say I do find it confident and bold when somebody says, yeah, you can call these three people. I know they're going to say great things about me, even if it comes out of left field. I think that that to me, that's like, yeah, you know, these people are got your back. I also like seeing who it is because it's like, <laughs> You put this person on your resume as your reference? Why? <laughs> like, or, oh my God, I love this person. Like, or these three people, if, if they're your references, you're in, dude. Like, that's the best. I don't mind chasing after people's references. Like, I'm, that's why I say I'm on the fence on it because, you know, they could come through with somebody that's great or whatever. And I understand the need for space and maybe not wanting the ambush to happen. Um, but I'm telling you like Whitney, if you make me a, a reference on your resume and you tell me that, that I'm a reference on your resume, if somebody calls me out of the blue, I'm gonna be like, Whitney's awesome. Like you've got to hire, you're insane if you don't like, and, and boom, that's it. There's no kind of speed bump there, but I do understand. I, I see both sides of it, I guess, is what I'm saying. And, and as somebody that hires and reads a lot of resumes, um, not always do I want to chase. That's the only. Thing. Yeah. Okay. I see, I I can see your, I see those are those were excellent points on why you might do it. And well, shoot, I may have to start doing that whenever I'm looking for a job again. Uh, but I, I'd like to to pivot just a little bit because um, we could really just talk about just resumes for like another two hours. But um, a topic that is uh, comes up so often and it is uh, I think just really important for us to address is the idea of imposter syndrome. And um, that may be coming up more in larger masses of people now that they may have had a break for the last year. But um, not necessarily do you individually suffer from imposter syndrome. Uh, I'll just say that I know that I do. It's like a, a freaking monthly occurrence sometimes. If just like I'm just having a bad day where it's like, man, I, I don't feel great. I hope I'm doing the right thing. Like, is this what I'm supposed to be doing kind of stuff? Or having this idea that people, that you actually are, are terrible at your job and they're going to find out. Um, that's kind of what imposter syndrome is for those of you that are unfamiliar. But how do you guys handle um, if you have experienced imposter syndrome uh, before? I don't want to necessarily call out anybody in particular. But, uh, oh, oh. I was saying earlier about... Um not often feeling like the smartest person in the room. And um, I've taught classes where there's been students out in the, <laughs> and they're, the, they're there to hear what I have to say. And I don't feel like the smartest person in the room. So um, I, I think just about everyone who is in touch with their, um, you know, their emotions and their uh, opinion of themselves and their, and they have some humility in the way that they uh, go about their, their business. I think, I think uh, people like that tend to 
to suffer from that. Um, and, you know, the, I, I'm trying to think who, um, who had the quote, but basically like, if, if you don't think you can do the job, just tr try it anyway, you know, because I mean, I, I have been thrown into situations that I, you know, had never done that one thing before, um, mixing monitors, uh, in an arena for the first time. Mixing, we've, we've all had to do that first time gig, uh, mixing a stadium, mixing, um, you know, my first night mixing a club is, is, you know, an epic, hilarious story because it, I it believe was, you've told it, it uh, it was uh, very tragic. It, it, it had, you know, it's been a lot of therapy. Um, but I, I think, I think we all feel at times like we've been given a great opportunity and we, you know, we probably don't deserve it. So I, I know for me, I'll, I'll say I suffer from it a lot. I, I, um, I overcome it a little bit by being as prepared as I can. Like the first few times I did a corporate event um, and I knew I was going to be routing signals here and there and, and using a console I wasn't very familiar with. I, I studied, I found out who in my town had that console and went over and played with it for uh, a, a couple of days to, you know, so I, you know, as far as feeling like you don't deserve to be there or, you're not worthy. Um, just try to try to prepare and educate and um, get some hands on time as much as you can. Yeah. And I might yeah. say that like for those just that, you know, um, want to do well, should you should always be kind of aiming to be a little uncomfortable, like periodically, just pushing yourself a little bit more. Because if you're not going into that uncomfortable area, you're not learning more, you're not growing more. And that's what's that's what will propel you in this industry. Uh, Tina, you had you had some thoughts. Uh, well, first off, um, running a, a legendary recording studio for about the first five years was um, major imposter syndrome. Like, why am I here? <laughs> why am I doing this? How? Why am I responsible for you know this giant facility? Mm -hmm. um, but you know, I think, like you said, like if you're not uncomfortable, you're not growing. Um, and I feel like that's why I did take one of the reasons why I did take this position. And then it's also, you know, just taking it step by step, really. Um, yeah, I think, I think, you know, as long as you take it step by step and like really, you know, like Jim had said, like do your research, you know, like I, one of my first really major engineering gigs was with the Blue Man Group and the, you know, the music director at that time met me in Boston and he said, you know, I like your work. I like, you know, I like working with you. We're going to move you down to New York and you're going to put together, cause he knew I was a tech. You're going to put together our studio. You're going to install pro tools cause it had just come out and you're going to start recording with us with pro tools. And it was like, I've <laughs> never run pro tools before in my life because it literally is, that new, you know, like I'd worked with sound designer, like two tracks, sound designer. That's like the, the most I had gotten. Um, but I think it's, you know, it's a combination of confidence, taking it slow, but working fast and, um, and, you know, taking a lot of deep breaths and, and working through it. Yeah. So that. if you're in that situation, most likely you, are, you deserve to be there. 100%. And I'll usually keep a few like, um, like behind this camera, I have a, a wall of like stuff. I'm, I'm really proud that I've done. And I just, I do that not only to remember, like to have the memories of me doing these things, but also to kind of, as a way to tell myself, like you've earned this, like you've done this, you've, you've done the work, you know, I've got, here's my, my first publication or this bad thing I did, like just all sorts of like little doodads or paragraphs or your first, blog post or whatever, just to remind yourself that you're not just like walking off the street. Like you have, you have in some ways like paid your dues and, and gotten to where you are for a reason. So, um, does anybody else have any, any thoughts on imposter syndrome or anything like that? I think, um, I think we're all winging it at some point. Yep. Um, please understand that I say I've been in the industry for almost 30 years. I, I don't really know what I'm doing. 
Um, I, I talk with confidence. I lead with confidence. Um, there have been make times until you make it. Yeah. I mean, I've really, uh, in many ways have, I don't have any managerial training. I'm a GM. I don't have any HR, uh, training. I book personnel, hire, do staffing. I've fired people. Um, I, I've reprimanded people. Like I, I don't have any of the background or, or anything in half of what I do. Um, it's okay. I don't care. <laughs> like I'll figure it out. I've got great resources. I've got good people around me. I've got people I can lean on. You're not alone. And that I'll, I'll always keep bringing it back around to the, the people that, you know, the people that you meet, um, the people that you feel kind of a kindred spirit with, uh, keep cultivating those relationships because those are the people that you're going to lean on when you feel like you, you don't know what you're doing. Or I had a friend early on that was like, look, say you can do it and then get on the phone and figure out how to do it with somebody that knows. Don't ever say you don't know how to do something. Now, there's a couple things that are not okay to lie about, like tying in power, rigging, you know, those things like, please, please don't bullshit your way through that. But if you want to bullshit through your way through, yeah, I can patch an eight band festival for, for an eight week tour, five days a week. Absolutely. I got it. Like no problem. Cause that was my first gig <laughs> on tour was Lollapalooza in 97 when it was still a, an actual tour. And I had, I had, I was a stagehand coming out of being a stagehand. I hadn't patched mics on stage for, but I, I bullshitted my way through it. And a friend of mine taught me how to, it was his analog. We, made charts we made patch changes we did all sorts of crazy things that i had never done before but my friends taught me how to do it because they wanted me to be on the tour with them so ultimately you've got a resource or an avenue or somebody that can you know help you through it um can't tell you how many people have come to our warehouse to learn a console or to build their file or to work on a file or whatever uh yeah whitney's been there um, and we'll always, always, always have that door open because this is how we help people grow and learn and, and we want to afford these opportunities to people. This is how you keep pushing your discomfort and absolutely you should feel uncomfortable. I don't feel comfortable in what I'm doing right now at all. So <laughs> don't worry about it. You're going to feel that way the rest of your life, the rest of your career, and that's okay. It's how you learn and grow and progress. Yeah. Yeah, I had said earlier about, um, and, and I do say this, and it's it's not false humility. I mean, I, I honestly don't think I'm the best at, at a lot of the things that I do, um, but um, I have all those best people on speed dial. Like they, I'm constantly in touch with the people who are better at me at measuring sound systems, better at me than, than patching Dante. Um, all of those things are people, I, I, I stay in touch with those people who are better than me at those things. So when I'm in a pickle and I make that call or a quick text, hey, do you have a second to, talk through a problem I'm having it's not the first time they've heard from me in two years you know like yeah. just you know and, and it, it's you know it's not insincere friendships if your friends are colleagues who are super super smart at stuff like um Sam and I you know our good friend Michael Lawrence like the guy is just he just is so smart at a million things and I probably text him email him three four times a month and just say hey what do you think about this but um you know, we, we all have to be our BS our way into the opportunities sometimes, but just when you get that chance, just be That's as bad. prepared as you can. And so when someone sees you actually doing that job, you're like, oh yeah, I knew this person had it, but you kind of didn't, but you figured out how, how to have it. So. Yeah. Yeah. I always, uh, Michael's a great, um, choice for that I'm just like hey I'm running this test like I, I have this correct right I'm I'm understanding this correctly that kind of stuff and I have it on kind of touching on the um like imposter sort of stuff like I have several friends who like we're in audio group texts with who I'm 
excellent friends with. I've been friends with them for years. We've kind of like grown into the industry together. People that I trust who I'm just, I can text and be like, I'm having a really bad like mental health day. Um, You know, I just need a little bit of reassurance and like having those kinds of people who understand the field, understand what you're going through and can kind of be there to help pick you up when you're feeling down. There's not like, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, and, And Whitney, I think you had a couple of things to say as well. Oh, I don't know. I think I was just agreeing with everybody. Um, it's like, this is my favorite topic so far. Um, I'm someone who, who I'm, I, I think I'm just naturally an anxious person, person, but I have anxiety. I would say on a hundred, almost a hundred percent of every gig I'm ever on at some point for me. Um, it's like, people would be like, Oh, are you nervous? You know? And I speak about this mostly for monitors for whatever reason, as a production manager at a venue, um, it's, it's, I don't, for whatever reason that I don't feel that kind of anxiety. It's more because I feel confident in the people I've staffed to do these. It's, it's more, it's more like, I just feel, I feel comfortable. Like I've, I've, I've done, I've hired the best people I could hire and it's going to go how it's going to go. Right. And if not, Mm -hmm. I'll figure it out. But when I'm the one in the hot seat, um, specifically this happens to me on fly dates when I'm filling in for someone else on their file, on their console, um, I've walked in where it's like, you know, I, I do what Jim said. Um, I might hit up Megan and go, Hey, I've got this fill in for this band. Um, I haven't been on an SD 10 in a while. Like, can I come bug you? And then I'll load the file and I'll browse through it. And, and, and it's not anxiety where it's like, I'm just feel like an imposter or, um, I'm nervous. I can't do the gig. It's just, it's an anxiety of like, I'm stepping into someone else's console file. I don't know what they have going on in here. You know, it's, I I could step on a bomb at any moment. Right. Like, and I, and I almost did, I had a a show where the file had for whatever, this is techie crap, but the, the file had like everything scoped. So like all the inputs, the outputs for whatever reason, you know, and I caught it in, when I was looking through the file at VER, I had a friend let me come in and I caught it beforehand. So in the show, I was able to avoid that scenario when we lost the kick drum channel, you know, like things, the best defense is a good offense. Like Jim said, like have as much information as you can. So when you're standing there, you're like, Hey, you know what? I did everything. If something goes wrong, you did everything you could have done. Right. Like I knew the console as well as I could have. I versed myself on the layout of the, the input list and the stage plot and, um, and, and that will help diminish some of the anxiety. But for me, there's always those moments because that's the nature of this, of this job is that things always can and might go wrong. Um, so for me, it's something that it's always kind of existed. And I think it might, if you do step into a role like that, I think it might be something you just kind of have to embrace. But that's also part of the payoff is like, when you have that anxiety, like, okay, like the show's starting, you know, like, I hope, yeah. I hope the drum kit doesn't light on fire. You know, <laughs> once the show happens and it's also many, it's kind of like jumping off a diving board for a race, right. you know, like I use that analogy because it's like, you're nervous, you're nervous, you're, it's almost anxiety. It builds, it builds, it builds. And then you jump off the diving board and it's gone. Right. So yeah. it's kind of like that for me. It's like, I just know, like, we just got to get through the first song, man. Like let's get through the first song. We're cool. Um, And the other thing is uh, also reaching out to, to um, just remembering gigs that you've done before or where you've been before, where you felt like this before, or things that you are proud of. Um, Sometimes when I'm feeling like, oh God, I don't know if I could handle this. um, I have a really long resume that I keep on my laptop. I never send it to anyone, but it has like everything I've ever done. I just keep it for like myself. And sometimes I'll look through it and I'll be like, oh man. Like I've, I've messed up way bigger shows than this, you know, like I got this, you know, yeah. like we got this. Um, yeah. It's important to remember so. how far we've come from where we're Cause it's easy to have that get lost over the years. Oh yeah. yeah uh, and I like the, um, if I'm not feeling like a little sick right before downbeat, like I'm going to be bored. Like I, I need that like anxiety and adrenaline. Right I just think it's bold. It's a bold move to not be like ready, you know, like to not be have some kind of anxiety like I feel like that's it means you care and um that you're in it you know if you start getting comfortable where you're just like yeah show's gonna start dude I mean that's a bold move you know I I don't yeah not me I wouldn't 
uh, okay, so uh, you know we've talked about um, resumes and imposter syndrome. We we touched a little bit on on networking, and I'd kind of like to swing back to that for just a few minutes. But yeah, uh, some people were asking, you know, how do we strengthen the online connections, uh, particularly that we've developed over the last year, um, and turn those into like real world connections, those real world connections we've kind of. Uh, networked with them maybe a little bit online and even in a pre and post pandemic world uh, we'll still have the internet and making connections that way so how do we cultivate that and, and move those into real world relationships tina um i think you know one thing that one thing that kind of came to my mind just after you know hearing jim speak and and megan and whitney and, and sam is Number one, just know like the industry that we're in is, is a community. It's not like we're selling insurance. <laughs> it's not like we're banking. Like it's, there's more of a human connection in this business than observing any, anywhere else that, that I've seen, you know, just going through, you know, life. Um, and I think you have to remember that human part of things. Um, I've made a few friends just through like, the sound girls uh, groups, the um, Hey Audio student that um, that mm -hmm. John Crivet from AES runs. Yeah. Um, people have actually just, you know, from like the comments on posts and stuff, people have actually just contacted me on a human level and like, hey, I really liked what you said. Tell me more about yourself or hey, you know, like, and just like really not even robotically be like, oh, hello, Miss Morris, this is so-and-so, you know what greetings. I mean? Like it was more like, yeah, greetings. This is me being professional. Like it was more like, Hey, like, I'd love to like expand on that thing we were talking about, but like, I didn't want to do it in the group. Like, can we just, can we just talk about that and your experience through X, Y, and Z? Um, so I think, you know, just really taking advantage of that. Cause I think the online stuff, uh, I think a lot of us, you know, if you guys are like around my age, we didn't have that when we were growing up, like when we were getting out of school, like there was, there wasn't even barely email. I think AOL was like there when I graduated college. Um, <laughs> so like really like, yeah, like just be a human. And if you, if you feel like you have a connection with somebody, just like pm them or dm them or whatever it is because i'm like really old i don't know what the cool terms are anymore ping them <laughs> poke them um yeah. so, DM. and just like really <laughs> and just like really just have a human conversation you know and and really take advantage and grow your community like this community is amazing like the live side the studio side the live and studio side i mean it just like kind of all mixes in together and I'm proud to be part of this community. I'm proud to be able to support, um, you know, these groups and this panel that we're on stuff like that, just because yes, we're all humans. We all care about each other and we're all just like a big giant family. So it's uh, take advantage of that and really appreciate it. Yeah. I think doing like sound girls is a great resource. Um, they have like a bi-weekly hangout. I think uh, AES has been um, a cool place to like meet other people uh, and just say, hey, I'll randomly, like, on Instagram, like, I follow a couple of, like, studio people. And every once in a while, they post something either on their story or something, you know, on their feed that I just think is really interesting. And I'll just DM them saying, hey, yeah, we've never spoken before, but this was cool or this is that. And, like, just starting, I get that, like, that human connection because we're all just, we're people. Um, and, you know, it's nice to have those those real conversations with people rather than it's then obviously fishing for a job, um, kind of things like that. Yeah, I, I agree big time in, um, leading off by being a human, being a, a, a cool person and saying something nice to someone who is maybe in a, uh, in a position, um, you know, of importance or someone, someone that you did enjoy something they wrote or something they said, or, uh, an opinion they had on, on something you care about. If you say, you know, you reach out and you say, I, I, I think that was really cool what you said and really insightful. And, um, you know, if you're able to friend them or then, you know, send them an instant message and give them your info or whatever, but it's, it's always nice to start off by, uh, you know, just saying something nice and 
and you know not not being all stiff and um and and i think uh covid one one thing that's been great during this whole thing um in that's in in amongst a whole lot of not great stuff has been um the check-in thing you know checking in on a friend and kind of you know starting your sentence off with i hope you're well i hope you're healthy i hope you're doing okay and um i have rechecked in with so many old old friends and colleagues just you know that i i wouldn't talk to all the time but just to, to be able to say hey just checking to see that you're okay because we've all been a little bit not okay this past year plus so mm -hmm. yeah. that, that's a good way to network for sure yeah any other thoughts on anything like that I've got at least one more topic that i'd like to to hit on um if nobody else has any any more thoughts it looks like nope okay um so and i love the phrasing of this particular question uh so people were kind of asking you know how do we get back on the horse now and how is how do we make this transition back into like working life uh how do we reinvent ourselves in our resume after a cataclysmic career change you know like a freaking global pandemic or whatever um you know how how do we do that because that is and we were talking about this before uh, we went live it's like suddenly things that we did for years are like really exhausting um, suddenly, like they're mentally, emotionally draining. Um, I know that I, for years I worked like seven days a week, you know, I'd have like two days off a month and I was totally fine. Uh, I was in my early twenties, things were great. Um, and now it's like, I, I don't think I could physically go back to doing that. Like it was just, it's so like, that feels like so much now and socializing can be exhausting. After this Zoom call, I will probably be tired. Like, it's, it's just how it is. Uh, how do you guys feel? Well, I, I think I said this before, which is, um, you know, this year, everybody kind of gets a, a hall pass, you know, this, this past, uh, actually, it's going to be 18 months easy. Um, and I don't, I don't know if I believe in the reinvention of a person. I think it's just the progression of a person. It's, it's, you know, everybody's like, when we get back to normal and it's like, when we move into a different phase of this, this is there, there's the past and there's the future. And I think now is actually a really great time and a really good opportunity for a lot of people in the industry to level up. If you've been a monitor tech, a touring monitor tech, and you've really wanted to be a touring monitor engineer, there's likely going to be an opportunity for you to be able to be a touring monitor engineer because there will be, I think there will be a saturation of people that want to get into the industry that don't have experience. And I think we're going to have a loss of experienced personnel hmm. uh, that are wanting to, that have found another way or, have, you know, uh, chosen another path. I have a friend that mixed a, a you know, a, a level artist uh, front of house. He found a job staying at home, mixing blog, doing blog work. And, you know, there's people that have, are creating space for everyone. So um just keep progressing and don't don't be afraid of and don't be afraid to change your mind either like yeah. I, you know there's a lot of people it's funny a lot of people have moved into studio work because that was the work that was available or a lot of people that were doing uh live uh entertainment have moved into television and stuff like that they might not come back out of that you know, they might really like what they're doing now, or they might make more money or have benefits or have something more solidified in their life. And, you know, I think a lot of people's personal lives have changed. People have had children, people have gotten married, people have gotten divorced. Like there's, there's so many shifts that have happened over this time too. And, you know, change is all right. And doing something different is okay. And then coming back around to something you love is amazing too, you know, but I, I think that being open and being willing is, is, is probably the name of the game coming back out of this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Tina. 
I think, you know, the thing that I'm witnessing is there is a lot of soul searching going on since we all had kind of a lot of time to sit down and be like, what is my life? You know, yeah. so there's, Who am I? there's different. Like Megan said, there's a lot of shifts of, you know, like I had some, you know, like even like the clients that we had, um, some clients were like, I have a studio at my house that I never go to. You know what? I'm going to let this, this studio go to work at home. Other people were like, I've been working at home way too long. I need to get out of the house and, you know, like let my wife and kid like do their thing while I'm at work because I'm driving them crazy. And then there's also, you know, like for us, a lot of people are like, oh, shoot, I can do my engineering at home and be at home. Like a lot of my engineers are, you know, the, the senior engineers are moving up. And what I'm running out of is entry level people um, to be runners because I'm moving them up so fast. Like through this whole pandemic, I think, um, you know, everybody that came in during the pandemic is entry level. They're all assisting now like within six months, it's kind of crazy that like the, the changeover for us has been really, uh, really fast. So I'm, I'm finding it hard to find, you know, like the, the runner people, um, not hard, but just, you know, I'm, I'm hiring them faster and promoting people a lot faster because of the whole soul searching. And, you know, those engineers are like, oh, Hey, I can like do my own remote stuff and, and everything. So, it, it's it's definitely I think if you look in the right places and are open to it I think people entering into the workforce are going to be able to take advantage of these like crazy holes where like the shifts are happening and everything so I, I as we kind of get going um, and the world is really revving up again I think it's it's actually like a perfect point to like jump in and and do your thing. Yeah, that's one thing has been as nice is that we've all dealt with this. So it's not like y just you and nobody else understands. We're all like, oh my God, that was a that was a time period, wasn't it? Um, so we do have that in our favor. So uh, absolutely. And, you know, there's no telling. Well, there's some telling uh, about what kind of jobs will come out of this. Like suddenly remote mixing is a thing that people care about. Um, um, broadcast, like more houses of worship the amount of houses of worship that were streaming before um, March of last year and today has got to be, it, it's an exponent. Um, like it is so many more. And those are jobs like broadcast engineering. Um, I know uh, Elliot's made the switch over and it's just like, that's going to be a thing now. It's just more streaming and more broadcast, more stuff on the web. Like those are all new job opportunities. So uh, any other thoughts on getting back on, on the horse. Jim. I think uh, looking for opportunities, you know, um, you, you had mentioned house of worship uh, mixing and, um, and, you know, I, I kept thinking throughout this pandemic, you know, what am, I, I have to mix like I, you know, and, and I have some friends here in Anderson uh, at churches and they let me come in and just multi-track, uh, you know, play stuff back through the PA and just to, listen to sound through a PA through, you know, through a console was, was amazing. And then, um, you know, I, I just threw my hand up and said any, you know, th this church that I I've worked with, they have like 12 satellite campuses. So I was like, if, if you need me to drive a few hours and mix on a Sunday, I'm there. Uh, I mean, I just picked up as many, uh, gigs as I could, uh, in, uh, churches and where, wherever they were available, um, so that I could mix. So I would say coming out of this, like, as you're, as we're all feeling, I think that we're ramping back into it, like start looking to, to, uh, get some opportunities so that when you, someone's going to pay you to do something or, uh, you know, put you on a tour or, or, um, ask you to mix a lot of stuff, you're, you're kind of feeling comfortable and you're not feeling totally foreign to it. Yeah. I also say that, it's okay. Like you can have an entire audio career in, in the house of worship sector. Uh, there's, they usually, the pay is, is usually okay, but the bennies are sweet. Bennies are extra good uh, in the church market. So just putting that out there. Um, uh, and worst case, a lot of times you get up really boutique equipment that you can, it's a safe place to experiment and play and, and get your chops up. Um, but I, 
you know, would uh, now like to, <laughs> Jesus, this check stuff. <laughs> Thank you, Whitney. Um, uh, I'd love to open the floor for anybody who has uh, any questions, whether you guys want to unmute and ask yourself, ask yourself or in the comments, like free open floor. We are here to, to answer questions for you guys. Mo Megan. Yeah, I just want to say, um, you know, one of the concerns was that first truck pack is going to kill everybody. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and if, if you are on a show or loading in a show, um, please be careful. And stretch. And, and, and in yeah, and in advance of getting back to the manual labor aspect of this gig, um, work on your body a little bit, get some strength going, pick up some heavy things a few times a day, and get used to walking around with them. If your back's bothering you, go find somebody to help you with that. Um, and then the other flip side that nobody wants to talk about, but we're starting to talk about more in the industry is your mental health. Um, if you're experiencing depression, anxiety, uh, or struggling in any way, there is absolutely no shame in seeking assistance for that. And um, please take care of your body and, and your mental health. Mm -hmm. They're both equally as valuable. And these are the things that are going to enable you to do an 18 hour day and make it through the day. Um, we're all going to hurt. I'm dreading the first pep festival I do, like how bad my feet are going to hurt, but you know, try and try and walk around a bunch and try and go out in our warehouse and stand on the concrete and talk to everybody and just kind of slowly break in those, those standing muscles and all of that. Um, but please be careful because the, that has been, a topic of discussion in our industry this whole time and and a concern of mine personally is when we come back is how wounded people are going to get physically from doing this job again so yeah please please take care of yourselves now and then uh, again if, if you're a touring person um you know really start taking a look at yourself on the mental side and, and if you need some support go seek it out. There's a lot of you like, you don't have to physically go and see people anymore. You can do telehealth. Uh, and there's great resources out there. Roadie clinics, a good one. Uh, if you're really struggling and need some support. Excellent points. Yep. Yep. Okay. So open floor. Does anybody have any questions? Anything that you would like us to elaborate on that we didn't, uh, any topics, anything like that doesn't have to be career related necessarily, but, uh, we are here for you. Um, I have a question. Hi. Um, I was wondering if any of you had advice for um, someone who is considering relocating to a place with more opportunities. Uh, some background is I live and work in a pretty small city. Um, I've been in contact with a couple of the venues that I mixed at prior to COVID and the plan is to continue to mix for them in September. And I feel pretty good about that, but what I want to do more is touring. And the more I talk to other engineers and the more I do my research, the more I think that it might end up being necessary for me to take that leap and move somewhere else. Um, I was wondering if you had advice about that. Thank you so far for everything. This has been a really good webinar. Thank you. That's a great question. Yeah. Any, any thoughts from any of you guys? It's great to have an opportunity, like a touring opportunity, uh, offered to you first, and then, then you can, then you don't have to move, you get to go and then at the end of that tour or through doing great work, they may say, hey, we can, we can use you a lot more and we can use you a lot more around town if you were here. Um, as far as going to a new place to do a lot more local work, I, I definitely think it's a great idea if, if you know that where you live, there just are, isn't much opportunity. I think it's great. I mean, I'm moving to Nashville this June because that's where our shop is gonna be and, um, you know, that's, that's where my new job is. But, um, you know, I lived in Orlando for many, many years 
because I did a lot of corporate work as well. And there was, that's where the opportunity was. So, um, but if, if you just want a tour, sometimes you can, you can work your networking and get on a tour without having to move first. I think that's, that's the point I'm making. Yeah, that is um, like, I'm kind of looking at two different plans. Like my first plan is over the next year, just stay and really try to do that networking thing with the people who come into the venues that I work at. But um, I'm just wondering, you know, what the alternatives are to that approach. But yeah, thanks. It's, it's definitely better if you already have something offered, you know? Sure. Always. <laughs> um, I can jump in on this too, um, I think. Um, so I lived, I lived out in Boston, like, like west of Boston in the middle of nowhere. And I was working, my first gig was like this metal venue. And like, I thought for sure, like, I'm gonna find somebody that's gonna take me on tour, right? That was my thing. Um, and I think you have to be aware of like what, I don't know where you are, but I think you need to be aware of like what, where are you, what are your opportunities, where you're at, and really look at them. Because I learned later that the metal venue, the whole metal scene is very, um, it's a boys club. And it limited the, I'm not saying it's not impossible, but it is, um, it's a boys club. So here I was trying to get on tour and it just never took off. Um, maybe I wasn't there long enough. I mean, you, you could look at it different ways, but. I ended up moving out to Los Angeles in uh, 2015 and it took a little bit. I was there for, I guess, a year or two before I got my, or no, I'm sorry, 2013. And then in 2015, I started touring and it was because of the connections that I was able to make, not just because of the venues or who was coming through, but just the amount of exposure. Like you're at multiple venues. Um, you might be working at um, a rehearsal studio uh, a tech that I had, I met her at a rehearsal place out here. I brought her out on tour in 2017, um, just because she was someone that I saw all the time. And I was like, God, that girl works hard, you know, but if she hadn't been there, you know, and she had, she was working all over town, you know, she was trying to get in with all stage hand over here, stage hand over there, you know, like that level of exposure is what got her that job, you know, and, and her attitude, of course. But, um, you could get lucky being there. Um, I think it, it's, you need to consider obviously like your personal life, you know, a move is a major move. Um, if you have family, if you have home is always home. Um, I think it's really hard to move away from those people. Um, but that being said, I think it could be worth being away for a little while just to make those contacts and those contacts that you make could always stay with you. They could always, you can always keep in contact with them and now you're kind of moving your seeds around. So once you consider kind of your, where you are in life, you know, um, and what your responsibilities are, um, I think it could be definitely worth your time. Um, that's, that's, it worked for me. I mean, it, it was a long road. It really was uh, to get to where I wanted, but it was, it was definitely beneficial to put my face out there where more engineers were, you know, cause ultimately that's where I got it was another engineer recognized me, um, a couple actually to get me on my first tours. Um, and if you're, if you're in a real small town and you're just not feel like you're meeting those people, um, I think it could be a longer road maybe, but with COVID maybe not because maybe more people are stepping out of the game. That's the other thing that's hard about it. You know, I think the grass is always greener. And I think a lot of people are looking right now and they're just following what, seem, what seems to be an opportunity, like Jim moving to Nashville. You know, it's like, this is, this is where it's going right now. And he's open to that and open, open, you know, he already has a gig that's a little different, but um, I, I, think, I think it could be a good thing for you if you've been there a while and it's not feeling good to kind of like show a different point of that like yes absolutely like if, if that's where the opportunities like are you're getting more exposure like lean into it um i i'm in kansas city i was born and raised here have no intention of leaving um you like grew as much as i possibly could in this city 
And then I found employment opportunities that would hire me even if I didn't live there. Um, and now all of my, all of my work is remote. I don't, I choose to live here at this point. None, I don't work locally. Um, you know, and that's a, a, a great privilege that, um, I have kind of fallen into. And, but that is a, that is a choice for you. You can find that more remote work or we get on tours where you can live wherever. Um, but then they just fly you out to this tour start or to, for prep. Um, like that is an option. You don't have to move, but you're just kind of like, it's going to be, it's hard for us to answer for you directly. You just have to like feel it out. It, that's, that's kind of the tough part, but there, but you can find success in both, both, both routes. So hope that, uh, hope I answered for you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Those, those are some good answers. Things yes. to consider for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Dennis, you have your hand raised. Yeah, guys, everybody. Thank you for doing this. It was, uh, definitely something that, you know, you don't hear many people talking about but welcome i was gonna add to christine uh, i came into life sound out of almost pure coincidence um I, I studied architecture and at the same time i played guitars and bands and things and somebody said hey can i borrow your guitar this one night ended up being the guy from the butthole surfers and i saw him in another bar the same night and he said he asked for the guitar again and at the same time he asked like hey can you run monitors I had no idea what that was, but he pointed to a console on the side and I went over there and stood over. Everything was running. So all I had to do was just, you know, nod and the show went on. He thanked me and that was it. But uh, it sparked an interest and this was going back to the mid nineties. Um, later on, I did get into sound. I lived in Portland, Oregon, and someone one day said, hey, do you want to do a steel call? And at that point, I only did, you know, little corporate gigs and things like that in Portland, Oregon. And I said, yeah, I don't know what steel is, but I'll go do it. He said, bring a hammer. Okay. I had done construction, so I have a nice big hammer still. And that led to a, a, a position that weekend for a touring uh, production called uh, VH1 Rock Across America. That was a big thing back in the late 90s. At the end of that weekend, I was asked to stay for the rest of the tour, which is flying in and out of Portland two times a week. It was pretty cozy. I even brought a guitar with me and everything. And at the end of that tour, the sound company was based out of New York City, asked me to come out to Wall Street and take a position with a VDOSC and a Mackie. And I said, how, how, how soon can you be here? I said, well, I'll be there in four days. And I've been here since 1998. Uh, it basically ended my touring career because I didn't need to leave New York City. I had, I made the same money here. I had the same variety, if not more variety for clients and, and acts and events and gigs, because I've done so many things that it spins my head sometimes. Um, but yeah, you just, Christine, you never know. Um, you just got to go for it. If you asked me 20 years ago, if I'd, have, if I'd have ever considered doing life sound, I would have probably said you're insane. Excellent. All right. Well, um, other questions, anybody want to, um, hop in, say anything? Still got several minutes. No, I'm no particular time. looks like there's quite a bit of, uh, chatting going on that I will have to read after this meeting is over. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'll comment on this chatting. Um, as the the freelancer stuff, it seems like the they're talking about um, the freelancers if they are able to get you work or not. If there's any if there's any um, if, if there's any merit to that. But um, a, as a freelancer, uh, I recommend people all the time for positions that I can't do um, or for tours that, hey, we, hey, we're out right now and we need somebody, you know, like that. I don't know if I uh, personally have had that experience. Um, I feel like it's, I feel like it's a community and people remember good people. And um, I, I think for me, like production managers, absolutely like with touring, with venues, they're the ultimate say, but that recommendation comes from someone else. That recommendation usually comes from one of my employees or someone else on the tour, a friend of a friend or whatever. So um, I, I kind of want to say I would disagree with you, Beth. Um, 
about that. I think, I think both are important. Um, I think, again, it goes back to like planting as many seeds as possible, but there's more engineers, I feel like, than production managers. So maybe being in those people's space and um, they're the ones that might end up recommending you. Um, you just never know. Uh, yeah. But yeah, okay. <laughs> I don't know who you're gonna get your next gig from. I had an art direction teacher in college that said, today's production assistant is tomorrow's producer. And, and there's a lot to be learned, obviously, from that statement, which is don't be shitty to the stagehands because you never know that stagehand that you're being shitty to is actually a touring production manager that could hire you in the future. Um, you cultivating your relationships regardless of, of who these people are and their station in the world. You don't know how people might move up. Um, you don't know who they're associated with. I have a friend who's a, a, a very solidified touring production manager that does go and work as a stagehand because he's curious to see how people interact with each other and to see new talent and to see new opportunities to hire people. Um, that you you just don't know who people really are or who they might know or and that comes back around to what Whitney said earlier talk about what you want to do and all of that but you know work on your friendships with everybody because you don't know how you might get your next gig or your next opportunity um that can lead you further down the path I mean that's basically how I am where I'm at right now is I'm the sum of all of my networking and all of my relationships. So um, when Tom Arco was going to hire me, he called everybody he knew practically and said, do you know Megan Holmes? I didn't give him a resume. He just called around and asked about my reputation. And I was lucky that the majority of the people that he called had something nice to say about me. And that comes from years of, of working on my relationships with all of these people. Um, you don't know how these opportunities are going to come your way. So it could come from a friend of yours that's a freelancer who can't do that gig or can't take that work or, you know, uh, it could come from somebody like me who uh, people write me all the time looking for engineers. They might not be for a band that we rent equipment to, but they're still calling and looking for somebody, you know, so you just don't know how you're going to get your next opportunity. Yeah. Yep. I get uh, asked frequently just because I, I come into contact since I started at uh, Allen and Heath and American Music and Sound. Like I've come into contact with lots of different people and they like know I'm from Kansas City. And so when they're looking for a particular something in Kansas City or even um, like, hey, we're looking for somebody in this area. Do you know anybody like that happens to me frequently, like probably uh, every other week, somebody is asking me like, hey, do you know anybody? And I will genuinely think like, oh yeah, I know people who I recommend right off the bat. I have people who maybe are coming in like second or third, like these would also be great options if that other person or these other people aren't available. Um, and I also have a, albeit short, but existing list of people that I would never recommend for a job. And I would per I would never put on a crew with me. Um, you know, it, it, you never want to be on that list. Like don't ever burn bridges unless something like egregious has happened. Uh, but, uh, uh Tina, you had, you raised your hand here. Um, yeah, I've got a couple of, you know, kind of lessons to be learned through my life where, you know, I was a studio supervisor at Berkeley college of music. There was this really, you know, just kind of like a very, um, energetic guy that, that would always get like these special reserved, you know, special gear for his sessions. And it was kind of annoying because there was like 10 pieces and he'd always reserve them. And it was like, oh gosh, this guy's kind of annoying, but I'll be nice to him because, you know, I'm just going to be a nice person. Turns out when I got to um, LA like 10 years later um, and I got to the, the village, I walked in, I was the runner that had, you know, on my first day walked into Studio D, there he was working for a really big producer and was a very good, um, a very uh, high confidant of the owner. So it was like, thank God. I was like really nice to that guy and never told him off no matter how annoying he was because he, you know, like when I walked in there, 
you know, the owner of the studio was like, what do you think of this? You know, whatever. And he could have just been like, oh man, like no way, you know, one time, you know what I mean? So you never know who's going to kind of, you're, you never know who you're going to meet afterwards. And um, it's just, and the other thing is like with like, you know, kind of touching back on like social media and stuff um, in like these groups and stuff, some people like really have have really been unkind and you know they get into these discussions and um especially like I've I've got one friend that you know felt like she actually had to say like hey guys can you just like stop mansplaining to like the female engineers in these you know and and you know some people are just really nasty I actually take note of that and I've actually not hired people that I've seen who have applied at you know to my studio because yeah it's like it social media is is more permanent than you think it is and um it just really shows you who you really are um and and i take that seriously so Mm -hmm. um yeah just you know remember to be a good human wherever (laughs) yeah uh i see people in i'm in a lot of groups i'm in like i'm on social media i'm very i'm on there as much as I don't want to be, um, like, yeah, I see it when I like come into contact and somebody's being like, I mean, this mansplaining is a huge jerk. Like, and then you go to their profile and they have some questionable, like, um, a lot of very loud political stances going one way or whatever. Uh, it's like, I I can see that. Like we can all see this. Like all I have to do is hover over your name and I'm like seeing this. Um, like people are not, it's like, why, why would I help? If you're going to ask me for help at some point, I'm going to be like, yeah, I'm, I don't feel like I'm just going to mark as red and move on. So yeah. And, and keep your social, your socials clean guys. Cause they are seeable. Um, one guy had some very questionable photos on his uh, Facebook page when I just like searched his name and it was like, Ooh, yeah, no, not, mm-mm. <laughs> Nope, don't need that guy at my studio. <laughs> yeah. So um, just keep that in, in mind too, is, you know, whatever, whatever anybody can search there, you know, they can find and you got to look, you got to look good. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. All right. Well, we've been going for, for about two hours. So I want to, and I'm, I know I can feel the exhaustion just, just off screen here when I walk out of here. Um, so I don't want to keep everybody on here too long, but again, open floor. Anybody have any last minute questions, uh, last comments from the panel, anything like that? All right. Definitely on the socials thing, I would just say, um, you know, just echoing what everyone was saying. Um, you know, if you don't have something nice to say, don't say it on socials, you know, like, you know, I, I am a very infrequent poster of anything on, on social media. I, I respond, usually respond to someone's cool uh, post or try to say something encouraging if somebody is feeling down and uh, you know, um, but I don't, I don't often go on there and just spew out a bunch of my opinions about, about uh, a topic. So mm-hmm. um because it is, it is part of your resume. Like, like you're all saying, you can easily go and search that person and see what kind of things they're saying. That's part of, they, they may send you a pretty resume, but this might be the reality of who they are. So, so yeah, just, just be aware that if you are someone of, especially a freelancer, who's always uh, needing the kindness of, of strangers and, and colleagues to get you gigs that just be a cool person and, and, uh, be that way in person, but also be that way where other people can see it. Mm-hmm. 100%. Okay. Well, Megan, Whitney, Jim, Tina, everybody. Thank you guys. Carrie also. Yeah. I know you're hiding back there. Uh, thank you so much for, for doing this with me for us, for sound girls. Like these are always a lot of fun and it's a perfect excuse to get in a room with you guys. Um, and catch up so meet for the first time yeah <laughs> i haven't meaning to text you anyways jim so this was perfect <laughs> uh, uh and um yeah i just want to thank you guys for your time so
Well, thank you for having me, guys, and you know, hope to see you all in the future. It's super nice to meet all you guys. I I I, I see your names all the time, and um, I I don't know you. Now I know you. So hit me up if I can ever help you out with anything. Same. Thanks, Jim. Nice to meet you guys. See you guys. Same here. All right. Nice to meet you all. You guys have a good one. Have a great weekend. Thank you. you too.